Okay, the minor prophet, Micah, and we're in chapter 4. Now, as you probably noticed, the first three chapters <clears throat> were admonitory. That is, they dealt with sins and the, the consequences thereof. Chapter 1 dealt with sins against God himself. Chapter 2, sins against each other. And chapter 3, sins by their leaders of Israel. And uh, so, we did that last time, sins of the leaders. Now this time, we're going to chapter 4. It's going, we're going to undertake a glimpse of the coming kingdom. There's a change of pace occurring here. In other words, the first three were pretty heavy chapters. And you obviously figured that out by now. But chapter 4, you're going to see a shift of gears here in a very positive direction. I think you'll find it very exciting. See, after all these indictments and the stern punishments of the first three chapters, we're now going to focus on the last days. And specifically on what most of us call the millennium. And it's interesting, in China, they call the, the Christians there, they call the time we're living in now the kingdom of preparation. And what we call the millennium, they call the kingdom of inheritance. And what's interesting is they feel that the, t the scripture teaches us that our responsibilities and opportunities and authorities in the kingdom of inheritance will derive from our faithfulness and our perseverance in the kingdom of preparation. And we think that's very, very provocative. But there's an essential preamble that I think we need to look at before we get into Micah's comments here. One of the most fundamental controversies in eschatology, study of the last days, is the issue of the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Is it literal or is it figurative? That's a big question. Unlike many of the other differences of opinion among scholars, this one, this issue, attacks the very character of God. Faithfulness to the unconditional covenants in the Old Testament. There are a lot of other things we can talk about where good scholars have different views, but this is one that starts to impact the credibility, uh, and the integrity of God himself. Let's talk a little bit about the Davidic covenant. In the New Testament, this was confirmed as the early commandments expressed to Mary that her child was destined to sit on the throne of David in Luke chapter 1. That throne did not exist during the duration of Christ's earth, uh, earthly ministry. The Idumean, Herod, he was an Edomite, appointed by Rome, ruled instead. There was not a, 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 a uh, descendant of David on a throne in, during Christ's ministry. Most of what we know about the millennium, by the way, doesn't come from Revelation 20. Some people say, well, that's just an allegory. Well, most of what we know about the millennium comes from Isaiah 65, not Revelation 20. So this passage we're going to encounter in Micah is among those that militate against any allegorical or spiritualized rendering of the millennial passages. I want to alert you to that right up front. The first three opening verses of chapter 4 of Micah are practically identical to Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 through 4. Now, experts are divided as to who quoted who. Some say that Isaiah quoted Micah, others say that Micah quoted uh, Isaiah, and uh, there's no way to tell who's correct. In any case, something we can all agree on is that the Holy Spirit was in charge in any case. But clearly, there's a very obvious identity of those two passages. So let's take a look at Micah chapter 4, verse 1. And in the last days, wow, and I can't, let's just notice that phrase to begin with. In the last days, it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow unto it. Now that first word, but, is an adversative conjunction. And uh, what it basically says that Micah is now moving beyond what he just talked about beyond the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar that we looked at in the previous chapter, and, uh, the, and, and also the destruction under Titus the Roman, which will occur in 70 AD. We're going beyond Nebuchadnezzar and beyond that other destruction of Jerusalem in, uh, after the New Testament period. In fact, beyond all other destructions unto 
a period that is commonly called the last days. Eschatology is the fancy word for simply the studies of what we call last days. So, in the last days shall come and pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord. Wow, strange phrase. Mountains can be literal mountains, and indeed they are. And yet they also are idioms for governments, as we'll see in a lot of passages. Uh, that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established on the top of the mountains. And there, see, it's using it two different ways there. The mountain is the government, so to speak, and it's on top of the mountains. And it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow unto it. This is the mountain that is profiled in the famous dream of Nebuchadnezzar that was given to you as an additional uh, reading assignment. Daniel chapter 2. We're all familiar with this multi-metal image. So let's take a look at that. Just re refresh our perception. Nebuchadnezzar was very troubled with a dream he had, where there was this man that had a head of gold, arms and chest of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, and legs of iron, and feet were iron but mixed with clay. So we had gold, silver, bronze, iron, and iron mixed with clay. Then in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, a very strange thing happens. In Nebuchadnezzar's dream, you may recall, there's a stone cut without hands that smashes this at the feet, crushes it, and that stone cut without hands grows into a mountain. And that mountain, by the way, isn't just regional. That mountain, it says, grows to cover the entire earth. That was a very strange dream. It troubled Nebuchadnezzar so much, and all his advisors couldn't deal with it because he put them to the test. He says, you've got to tell me what the dream was and what it meant. He says, well, you tell us your dream, and we'll tell you what it meant. He says, no, 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 you're stalling for time. Off with your heads. That was literally what he said. And so the point is, Daniel says, wait, 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 wait. Give me a chance at it. So Daniel tells him what the dream was, and he's blown away because he remembers, he realizes that Daniel was, had special knowledge. Then Daniel not only explains the dream, he interprets it for him, and it becomes a timeline of nations. But uh, we won't go through all of that here. But the, he says, Thou sawest till a stone was cut without hands. And that's incidentally, as you probably recognize, one of the titles of the Messiah. The stone which the builders rejected, the headstone of the corner. And it, that, the word stone is used in a half a dozen different ways throughout the scripture as a title of the Savior. The stone that was cut without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay and break them to pieces. Then, get this, was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. Interesting use of phrase because that's also used of the tribulation in some other passages. And the wind carried them away so that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain, and filled the whole earth. That's where we just, that's just, uh, our diagrams was intended to represent that text. Now, we know, of course, from studying this, that the gold represents Babylon, the silver, Persia, the brass, Greece, the iron, Rome, in phase one, and the iron with clay, Rome again, but in the second phase, and we don't have to get into that all here. Most people recognize, though, that these are actually four empires. The fourth empire has sort of two, fa uh, two uh, phases, if you will, but that doesn't concern us directly here. Just recognize there are basically four materials and four empires. And uh, Babylon and Persia and Greece had definitive risings and fallings. But Rome had a rise, but it's never, never been superseded. It still lingers, if you will, in, in the shadows of history. But now notice, this is the verse that is so uh, important to us in this study here. Verse 44 of Daniel 2, where Daniel is interpreting this for he says, and in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So this is a fifth kingdom. It's the fifth in a list of five. The God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom. And that is what is described in Daniel 2, and that is what Micah is going to deal with here. And that's exactly what the book of Revelation deals with chapter 20 and a lot of other passages. Now let's stand back and get this in another context that we need to really understand. There are a number of covenants in the Bible, but there are four that are unconditional, meaning they're one-way 
commitments on the part of God. Therefore, they're faithful. Anything that requires us to do something is likely to fail. There are four con uh, covenants that are unconditional which are on the part of God alone. The best known one probably is the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 12. But there's the land covenant, an extension of that to Abraham in Genesis 15 and 17. And then there's the covenant with David in 2 Samuel 7. And of course, the everlasting covenant in Jeremiah 31. And it's from that covenant that the New Testament gets its name. What's interesting about these other three covenants, they're all under attack. The Abrahamic covenant is really under attack by the world. Anti-Semitism is essentially a challenge uh, uh, to God's chosen people by the world. The land covenant is a challenge by Islam. That the, the land that they're in that was covenanted to, to Israel from God himself is being challenged, of course, by Islam. What may surprise you is the Davidic covenant, also an unconditional covenant, is also being challenged by the church. I would say there's probably nine out of ten churches, denominational churches anyway, that believe that the Davidic covenant is an Old Testament thing. They don't see the millennium as being literally fulfilled. Big mistake. Big mistake for a lot of reasons, and we'll try to touch on that. And it's the Davidic covenant that we want to touch on here as a little bit of background before we go further in Micah. Every Christmas, we're familiar with Isaiah 9, 6, and 7. We see it on Christmas cards and the like all the time. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Interesting verse, familiar to all of us. For unto us a child is born, praise God. Unto us a son is given. Those are not synonymous one of the discoveries we need to make as we study our Bible is there's no such thing as a pure synonym. Even things that seem synonymous are not necessarily identical. A child is born is human. A son is given is divine. The child was born in Bethlehem, and the son was given at Golgotha. And we need to understand that. In fact, the birth of that child will be a principal topic of the next chapter of Micah, interestingly enough. But notice what goes on here. The government shall be upon his shoulder. Really? When was it? Has it ever been? Notice the next verse in Isaiah, verse 7 of chapter 9. Of the increase of his government peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David. On the what? The throne of David. That did not exist in Christ's ministry. Is that going to happen? Absolutely. It was promised to uh, Mary, as we'll see in a minute. And upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Well, when we get to, you say, that's Old Testament stuff. No, 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 no. Let's take a look at the New Testament. Luke chapter 1. Gabriel tells Mary, Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. And he shall be great and he shall be called the son of the highest. The Lord God shall give unto him, what? The throne of his father, David. Did that happen during the ministry in the New Testament? No, hasn't happened yet. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there shall be no end. Here's another reference to the kingdom that we're talking about. Let's move on to the Acts chapter 1. After the gospel period, we have the, the scene of the ascension. And the disciples there, they, when they came together with him, he said, they asked of him saying, Lord, Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom? He's, see, he's resurrected now. He's met him up there in Galilee. Now he's back in Jerusalem. Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times of the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. The kingdom to Israel. He doesn't deny it's going to happen. He says it's just not for you to go set dates here. He's going to do it in his own time. But again, he's confirming that very issue right here. His last Remarks, while he's on the earth, confirms this. We get to the middle of the book of Acts. The pivotal event of the book of Acts is the, the Council of Jerusalem, where they're arguing about a couple of things. And James himself, quoting from the Old Testament, answers them. He says, and to this agree the words of the prophet, as it is written. And then he's going to quote Amos chapter 9, verse 11, where God says, after this I will return. Interesting phrase. In order to return, he must have left. After this I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David. Wow. 
which has fallen down, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. That's not the temple of Solomon. The tabernacle of David is a palace, a king's palace, not a priest's temple. Interesting. That the residue of men might seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles. Wow. Upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things. Known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. So there it is. There's another thing I want, I think I uh, highlight several times in our studies, and that's the concept of resolving power. It's a term from optics. You get a cheap telescope and go out to the sky and look at a star, you see a bright spot. You go back to the store and spend lots of money and get a really good telescope, you look at that same star and you discover, whoops, it's actually two stars. The ability of optics to discern two things that are almost the same, but sees them differently, is called in optics resolving power. And the same thing occurs in language. There are two words that you think mean the same thing, and they almost do, but where, that watch out for that word almost. Now there's a term that occurs through three of the Gospels. Mark, Luke, and John use the term kingdom of God. But Matthew alone uses a slightly different term. He calls it the kingdom of heaven. Are they the same thing? Well, let's take a look at this. We discover that the kingdom of God is all-inclusive. Everything outside God himself can be called the kingdom of God, the angels. Things long before the earth was even created were all in his kingdom. But Matthew uses the term the kingdom of heaven, which is a subset, a specific sub-piece of that, included in, but not, not, uh, uh, but, uh, not necessarily including all that. And only Matthew uses that term, but he uses it 33 times. And there are many people, many of the commentators say, well, that's just synonymous. He just chooses to use that phrase because it's a Jewish phrase. No, because Matthew five times uses kingdom of God. Some say, well, that proves they're synonymous. No, it's synonymous. No, it doesn't. It proves they're different. Matthew is being more specific, dealing with a subset. And uh, 33 times he makes it that specific other times you call it kingdom of God, and seven times something else, and so forth. Now, one of the things that we discover is that the word of and from are identical in both Hebrew and in German. To say I'm from uh, uh, Coeur d'Alene, I'm Chuck from Coeur d'Alene, I mean, it gives you, that's my source, where I came from. That's not, that can be part of my name, but there's no equivalence between my name and that. It's not a genitive of apposition, it's a genitive of source. And we discover that this term, the kingdom from heaven, is a genitive of source. It's the kingdom that came from heaven and not a genitive of apposition. Heaven and the kingdom of heaven are not synonymous or e equivalent to one another. So it's, if I say kingdom of heaven, you get confused. You confuse that with heaven. But if I'm more precise, it's the kingdom from heaven. Oh, it's a kingdom that happens to come from heaven. And that's what we see in Daniel chapter 2. There are five kingdoms. Each one has a geography and a capital and a king and subjects. Great. One, two, three, four. The fifth one is God's kingdom, but it's the fifth of five. It has geography, has a capital, has a king, has subjects. That's the point we need to understand. Many people are confused by that. So, let's refresh our memory on Daniel 2.24. Uh, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom. In other words, idiomatically, it's the same as the previous ones in structure. It's, it's isomorphic with that. Will, which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So we need to understand that it's a kingdom in the sense of being the fifth of a sequence of five. Okay. Now, my wife and I have just finished a book called The Kingdom, Power, and Glory, which gets into these issues. And uh, uh, it, it uh, includes the origin of evil and studies that go with it. Uh, Thy kingdom come. We pray that in the Lord's Prayer. Most Christians have no idea what they're praying for when they pray for thy kingdom come. What are we talking about? This is what we're talking about. And it deals with eternal security and inheritance and rewards. A lot of times. It's amazing how controversial some of these topics are. And uh, we're encouraging people to do some homework and come to their own conclusions on these topics. But let's continue now. Let's get back to Micah chapter 4 verse 1. Micah says, But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established on the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow into it. And so obviously mountain, a mountain of mountains is often an idiom of government, as in Daniel 2 and other places. And from the stone cut without hands, the rock of the fence, the stone which the builders rejected, becomes the headstone of the corner. These are quotes out of Psalm 118, and all through the scripture. They, 
echo, if you've read your Bible, they're very familiar terms for none other than our Creator, Jesus Christ, as He is incarnate as, in, 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 uh, as our Savior. Now, Zion will be the governmental and spiritual center of the whole world, not just Israel. Our king is going to rule the planet Earth from Jerusalem. Okay? All shall, above the hills, all people shall flow to it. Now, the temple, or we call it a temple, maybe it's more of a palace, is going to be rebuilt. And uh, the tabernacle of David is what Amos 9, verse 11 calls it, and that's what James in Acts 15 referred it to. So let's not confuse it with Solomon. Now, there's also going to be, by the way, we know from Zechariah 14 others, dramatic physical changes to the whole region. So don't be surprised by some of the maps you're about to see. The prophet that received the most revelation regarding the mountain of Yorhivave, his house, was Ezekiel. We find it in Ezekiel 17, Ezekiel 20, Ezekiel 40. In fact, the last nine chapters of the book of Ezekiel are focused on this whole issue. And the flow of the people will be spiritual will be spontaneous. That's the meaning of the original word in Hebrew, a spontaneous flow. And uh, Zechariah 8, there's a similar prophecy of, this at the same, of the same time. Let's take a quick look at some of the details of the strange structure described in the last nine chapters of the book of Ezekiel. We recognize the basic pattern as it's described as being very similar to the tabernacle, in fact, more specifically to the Temple of Solomon. Very similar, except we ha- it has some other details. And uh, it has chambers for singers and all that specified. The point is it has so much detail, it defies you to try to apply it allegorically. It's incredibly precise. We have chambers for the priests. And uh, we have uh, priests' kitch- kitchens just for the priests. We'll, we'll back away because we're going to get bigger here. We have inner gates described. We have outer gates described. And we have the chambers of the outer court described. And we have the people's kitchens, different from the priest's kitchens. The point, the, the issues aren't critical here except to realize it's a specific place that's going to be built. It hasn't been built yet. This does not describe anything, the likes of which have been done so far. So this is something else that's coming. It has outer gates. And there's a darkness that's outside. It is referred to 23 times in these descriptions. And that, that in itself has its own controversies. Well, this isn't the whole story. There's a holy district described there. It's about 25,000 cubits square. And right in the middle of this is the temple, as we call it. Maybe it's more of a palace. And uh, there are living quarters for the sons of Zadok. The Levites are uh, relegated to menial tasks. The Levites also have, but, but they're secondary to them. And this not in Jerusalem. It's substantially to the north. Some many miles, maybe. So Jerusalem, the temple is not in Jerusalem, interestingly enough. There's food growing places allocated. And uh, there's a portion for the prince. And who's this prince? No one's quite sure. Because he's not immortal, he has descendants and so forth. And yet, is it a sin of... What, uh, there's a lot of rabbinical uh, head scratching going on over those passages. And there, the, the, the water comes from the temple, flows to Jerusalem, and then flows to the Mediterranean to the west and to the Dead Sea to the east. So there's water flowing there. Wow. That's not the least of it. Now, we discover that the land is being divided among the the, uh, tribes to the north. Going north from the Holy District is Judah, Reuben, Ephraim, Manasseh, Naphtali, Asher, and Dan. And going southward, it's Benjamin, Simeon, Issachar, Zebulun, and Gad. These land grants are specified in Ezekiel. And this is obviously a region that is much larger than really is con- uh, uh, con- uh, in confined by the borders today. It's going to be very different. So let's get back to Mi- the second verse in chapter 4 of Micah. And many nations shall come. Notice that. Many nations shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways. And we will walk in his paths. For the law shall go forth of Zion and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. All nations, notice, the source of all truth, guidance, and jurisprudence to all nations will, come, will spring from this area. Disputes will be crisply resolved. Why? The law will be enforced with, get this phrase, the rod of iron. That occurs in Psalm 2. That occurs all through the scripture, almost as an identity of the Messiah himself. Psalm 2.9, Revelation 2.27, Revelation 12, Revelation 19. It occurs again and again. 
Now, a small observation, but it's interesting to reflect on. The temple, as we call it, will only be open on Shabbat and the new moon. It won't be open. It'll be closed on Sunday. That should give a number of our Christian friends a little a pause for thought. That doesn't mean you can't worship on Sunday. Don't misunderstand me. But it does mean that it never ha- we've never lost the sanctity of Shabbat or Saturday. It's the seventh day of the week. And it's going to be so observed in this future period. Let's go on here, verse 3. And he shall judge among many people and rebuke strong nations afar off. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So our Messiah's rule is going to be very literal and very effective. Peace. Finally, weapons will be converted to peaceful uses. Military science courses will be unattended. <laughs> you know, it's interesting that the inscription of these words, these very words, on the UN building is really ironic. This pagan, anti-Jewish affiliation may prove to be the cursor, in fact, I'll say the adversative precursor to the realm of the coming world leader, commonly called the Antichrist. The word Antichrist meaning instead of Christ. Yes, against Christ, but more specifically, in his place is the idea. And if you want more about this, we have a briefing package called Behold a White Horse, or also have a, uh, we have a commentary on the book of Revelation. And we even have a whole briefing on the Antichrist, an alternate view, for those of you that want to dig into that. But let's get on to the fourth verse. We actually got four verses going here. It's pretty good. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts hath spoken it. Wow. Now this verse is not found in the corresponding Isaiah passage. Up to now, these verses are parallel to chapter 2 in Isaiah. But this verse doesn't correspond to the Isaiah, although it does continue the thoughts of peace, prosperity, and security we find there. And there's, it echoes in, in 1 Kings 4 and 1 King, 2 Kings 18 and so on. Now, the, both the vine and the fig tree were native to the area and had common fruits. But it gives rise to something else I thought I would include in your notes. We know that the vine is used also as an idiom for Israel. We know the fig tree is also used as an idiom for, for, for Israel. What may surprise you to know that those uses are not only universal, they're very subtle in the way they're used. The vine was often a symbol of the nation of Israel among the prophets and psalmists, and there's a lot of passages for that. It's also even used on some of the later Jewish coins to the vine to represent the nation. The fig tree is also a frequent reference and was used idiomatically by Jesus himself when he curses the fig tree and it's used it, it quotes in the, in the, uh, the, the all the discourse and so on. So the, one thing I was delighted to discover through my rabbinical friends is to discover that these idioms are not identical. They're used subtly in special ways. And the key that unlocks that is a parable of Jotham. It's called the parable of the trees in Judges chapter 9. Jotham gives them a parallel. And let's just take a quick look at it. There's some background here. And when they told it to Jotham, he went and stood at the top of the Mount Gerizim and lifted up his voice and cried, and said unto them, Hearken unto me, ye men of Shechem, that God may hearken unto you. The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them. And they said unto the olive tree, Reign thou over us. This is, and there's, by the way, a number of these parables in the Old Testament. It surprised you to know the parables in the Old Testament. Nathan has one of the ewe lamb, the parable of the woman of Tekoa in 2 Samuel 14, the parable of the thistle in 2 Kings 14, the parable of the vineyard in, in Isaiah 5. It precedes the, the, five, the six woes and so on. But let's get back to this one. He continues, The olive tree said unto them, Should I leave my fatness, wherewith by me they honor God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? And the trees said to the fig tree, Come thou and reign over us. But the fig tree said unto them, Should I forsake my sweetness, my good fruit, and go to be promoted over the trees? It's interesting, you know, Ezekiel 31 and Daniel 4 does use trees to represent kings, by the way, as an aside. Then said the trees unto the vine, Come thou, and reign over us. And the vine said unto them, Should I leave my wine, which cheereth God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? Then said all the trees unto the bramble, Come thou, and reign over us. 
The bramble said unto the trees, If in truth ye anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow, and if not, let fire come down of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. Which is an idiom, by the way, of the temple, but let's go on here. This is the parable of the trees, and the rabbinical perspective of this is there's an olive tree, which is synonymous with valuable oil. There's a fig tree, which has sweet fruit. There's a vine, which, from which we make wine. And by the way, not, not grape juice, because you can't have grape juice without refrigeration. I won't go there for here. Let's just keep going here. And then the bramble is, of course, has no fruit. It's too low to produce any shade. It's only good for fuel for the fire. So these are the four idioms that occur in the parable. So the olive tree speaks of Israel, but in the genetic sense, being grafted in and so forth. The fig tree speaks of Israel in sense of its political role to bear fruit. And remember, it was cursed because it didn't bear fruit in, in the New Testament. Then the vine, of course, speaks of spiritual, the wine, and, and so forth. Now the bramble speaks of Satan, um, Satan's empire, or the world, or how, however you say it. So it's interesting to discover that these subtleties of this parable has a certain consistency in application throughout the entire 66 books we call the Bible. It's one of those fingerprints of the Holy Spirit that it's amazing that these idioms have a, a consistency of application, even though you've got 40 different authors over 2,000 years writing these 66 books. Well, anyway, let's get back to Mike. I just thought that would be interesting to insert here. For all people will walk every one in the name of his God, and we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. This verse can be easily misunderstood. Although the heathen peoples worship their own particular gods now, Israel will be worshiping the living God, is really what comes out of that, that root text, if you will. On January 6th of 1941, Franklin Delano Roosevelt gave his famous speech on what he called the Four Freedoms. Those of you that studied that period remember the free, his speech on the freedom of speech, the freedom of religion, freedom from want, freedom from fear. These were his, this was his famous Four Freedoms speech. Well, Micah's list is similar, but begins a little differently. The freedom from ignorance of the law of God, freedom from war, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. So these things are... Our, our Roosevelt speech was really an echo of the structure in Micah's list for what that's worth. But let's get to verse 6. In that day, saith the Lord, will I assemble her that halteth, and I will gather her that is driven out, and her that I have afflicted. See, before Israel can enjoy the Messianic kingdom, she's got to be regathered from her worldwide dispersion and settled in her own land. And that's, of course, what Ezekiel 37 is preparing it for. Now it's interesting that the fig this idea of halteth is that there's a flock-like figures here. This figure of the scattered flock resumes the image of restoration we had in chapter 2, if you will, where we deal with a good shepherd and so on. So this is another passage with the perspective of the great shepherd. And of course we find that not only in Psalm 23, in fact Psalm 23, 24, and 25 have him as the good shepherd, the chief shepherd, and so forth. Um, and of course in Isaiah and John 10 where he claims to be the good shepherd. Let's go to the next version. I will make her that halted a remnant and her that was cast far off a strong nation. And the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth even forever. See, the remnant, you'll discover, is a key focus of Scripture throughout. We speak, it's always just a remnant that's saved. When you talk about the flood of Noah, God erased the whole bunch and left, started over with eight people. There's a remnant of only eight there. And again and again and again throughout the Bible, we're very disturbed to discover it's only a remnant that seems to get it, that really uh, accomplish what God's purpose is in them. The remnant is always a key focus. And it was only a remnant that came out of Egypt. Virtually an entire generation died in the wilderness. Even Moses didn't enter into his inheritance. He was buried at Mount Nebo. Interesting to me. Even in Elijah's day, he goes and weeps upset because there were 7,000 that he didn't know about that had not bowed the knee to Baal. Very strange passage there in 1 Kings 19. Even in Christ's day, there was just a small remnant that really received him. The leadership did not. So even today, there are but a remnant that are real. 
And one of the questions you might put in your notes, how sure are you that you would be included if that was tallied right now? Ooh. And then, of course, we have the throne of David in Luke 1, 30, uh, chapter 1, verse 30, 32. We'll talk more about that, by the way, in the next session. But we're down to verse 8. And thou, O tower of the flock, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, unto thee shall it come, even the first dominion. The kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. Wow. The tower of the flock. You'll notice that Micah is going to focus here in this, these idioms, two different idioms, two different places. He focuses on two places, the tower of the flock. Migdal Eder is the term, is the t- it was the tower of the flock, the shepherd's tower in Genesis 35 mentions the tower of Eder as near Bethlehem. And according to Jerome, who lived in Bethlehem until the 4th century AD, it was about a mile from Bethlehem, the birthplace of David. Now the next chapter is going to nail this down. The next chapter is going to dramatically identify the very birthplace of the Messiah. So we'll save some of that discussion for chapter 5, verse 2. But at the other place that Mike is alluding to here is the stronghold. It's a fort or stronghold. It's on the southeast slope of the Temple Hill, opposite to Mount Zion, separated from it by the Teropian Valley, or sometimes called the Valley of the Cheesemakers. It's the valley that no longer is there. The Kedron Valley is still there, and the others are, but that's the Teropian Valley since it's been filled in. But anyway, this fort was fortified by Jotham in 2 Chronicles 27 and Manasseh in 2 Chronicles 33, and it's the place from which David ruled. So it's a, it has a palace flavor to it, if you will. David was both a shepherd and a king, and these two places will be restored and magnified in the Messianic reign because David was a shepherd and a king, and our, our Messiah is in a very real sense both a shepherd and a king. And... Uh, He's a good shepherd, a chief shepherd, and so forth. Now let's get back to the Babylonian captivity. What, now, what Mike is now going to do, he's going to turn from the ultimate glory of the millennium to the dark future immediately before them, back to reality, back to his gang that are there facing the Babylonian invasion and the captivity of Judah. And uh, th- this captivity, this invasion captivity, wouldn't occur until about a century after Micah's day. You recognize that from his point of view, it's physically quite future. That should remind us of something else that occurs in prophetic literature. The prophet may see two things in front of him, a near thing and a late thing, an early event and a later event, with a time gap between them. And he may not be sensitive. Is that gap a week, a year, or several centuries? I mean, he doesn't know. And uh, in fact, the, the anticipatory thing is called a type, and after the Greek term tropos, and uh, the thing it's foreshadowing is called an antitype. The antitype is simply something that is anticipated in a type. But this is a very common perspective, and you're going to discover that in these passages, one moment he's talking about the immediate captivity that's facing them from Nebuchadnezzar. And um, a little bit later, he'll include things that really apply to the destruction of Jerusalem under the Romans in 70 AD. And yet, even more so, he'll refer to things that are yet even ahead of that, that are still ahead of us in our day. Interesting. And then we understand each one by understanding how the previous one was fulfilled. Starting at verse 9, Why dost thou cry out aloud? Is there no king in thee? Is, there, is thy counselor perished? For pains have taken thee as a woman in travail. Here's that phrase again that Jesus himself adopts in the Olivet Discourse. All these are the beginning of sorrows, beginning of birth pangs. That idiom is again and again and again used. There are two idioms that are used of the tribulation continually. The woman in travail and also the thrashing floor. Those are both terms that are used at that period. Why dost thou cry out aloud? Well, they've been uh, crying out uh, aloud over the approach of the Chaldeans. That's what he's alluding to, because that's facing them. They're on the horizon here. Well, the question is, why don't they turn to their king and counselor? Hmm. Now, this is viewed by some authors as a taunt in her distress. It may simply be an indication of her helpless condition when her king is taken captive by the Babylonians. That's very graphically described in Ezekiel 12 and elsewhere. Judah was going to lose all kingly rule. And they never regained that kingly rule. Even when they come back from Babylon, they, they have a different kind of an era. And then when Antiochus Epiphanes 
get, uh, gets overthrown by the, uh, the Maccabean revolt, they go to the Hasmoneans. Those are not kings of Judah. The re repetitive comparison to the birth pangs of the woman in travail. Very frequent metaphor regarding the end times too in Matthew 24, 1 Thessalonians 5, and elsewhere. Continuing verse 10. Be in pain and labor to bring forth, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. There it is again. For now shalt thou go forth out of the city, and thou shalt dwell in the field, and thou shalt go even to Babylon. There shalt thou be delivered. There the Lord shall redeem thee from the hand of thine enemies. So Micah, just like Isaiah, looks beyond the then current power of Assyria to the subsequent coming rise of of Babylon. You understand that when he's doing all this, Assyria was the dominant factor. Babylon was just a, a town in Assyria, a subject of pol political intrigues. But he, he's looking beyond that where Babylon's going to rise to be a world empire. That's yet future from his comments here. Now Isaiah, just like Micah, also prophesied of the Babylon captivity in Isaiah 39, the last chapter of what we call the first big main segment, Isaiah. And, that's, and he details how King Hezekiah foolishly flaunted his treasures to emissaries from Babylon. Big, big mistake. Big mistake. That's like showing a pickpocket how fat your wallet is. You know. There they will be delivered in that place, it says, Babylon. And how will they be delivered? By the hand of Cyrus, a Persian. And that's all described graphically in 43, 44, and 45, and 48 chapters the chapters of Isaiah. But interestingly enough, they're pretty much cured of bi idol worship in the cauldron of Babylon. They're guilty of a lot of things subsequently, but this penchant for idol worship that plagues them throughout their whole history, from Joshua all the way through to, to this time period, it suddenly evaporates. That's one thing they don't do. They do a lot of other things that are offensive to the Lord, I think, but that's one thing they seem to have widely been cured of. Okay, we get to the final siege. You know, many commentators assume that the following is a continuation of the Babylonian siege. It might be. I don't think so. Others think the Assyrians are still in view. I don't think so. I believe that this looks ahead to the final stay, uh, siege rather than the siege of verse 9. This is a look ahead, if you will. The Holy Spirit looks ahead to the last great attack by the nations of the world against Israel, in my view. And these subsequent events are those of Joel 3, Zechariah 12 and 14, and other portions of Old Testament scriptures. That's my view. Don't accept it. Just understand that is a view. Do your own homework. Come to your own conclusions. Let's get on to verse 11. Now also many nations are gathered against thee. See, I, that's one of the reasons I have that view. Many nations, not just one. It's not just Persia. It's not just... Anyway. Now also many nations are gathered against thee that say, Let her be defiled, and let our eye look upon Zion. And so the great confluence of peoples and nations to uh, Jerusalem are summarized, that were summarized in verse 2, will be preceded by a final onslaught of nations against Jerusalem and the people of God. That's what Ezekiel 38 is all about and so on. Their purpose is to defile Zion. They will look with delight on the calamities of the Jews. And that becomes the main hobby of the Edomites, to, to uh, cheer on their adversaries. The Holocaust in Germany took one Jew in three. To do a rough estimate of the, of the Holocaust, it, it's, a, it's about one-third of Jewry was taken through what we call the Holocaust. Zechariah 13, verse 8 and 9, suggests that the next Holocaust, there will be another one, will take two out of three. Wow! Can you imagine? The Armageddon campaign will be targeted on Jerusalem, but they will follow the pursuit of the remnant which had fled, under Christ's instructions in Matthew 24, to Basra, Petra. Basra is the Hebrew, Petra the Greek. But the point is, they're going to flee. So the, 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 there isn't a battle of Armageddon. That's where they gather to go against Jerusalem. But as the remnant flees to Petra, they shift over. We've talked to that before. Okay. Verse 12. But they know not the thoughts of the Lord, neither understand they his counsel. For he shall gather them as the sheaves unto the floor. That's a threshing floor phrase there. The threshing floor. Gather them as sheaves that going to the threshing floor is the concept. The gathering of nations is nothing less than the Lord's assembling of them 
as sheaves to the threshing floor. It's going to serve his purpose, in effect. And the threshing floor, as I've indicated, is often seen as an idiom referring to the Great Tribulation. You see it in Isaiah 41. You see it in Jeremiah 51. Uh, you also, and, and actually in, in, Luke, uh, in uh, um, Ruth chapter 3, verse 9, and so on. See, it's, it's significant that Ruth, the eventual bride of Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, is at Boaz's feet during the threshing floor scene in Ruth chapter 3, verse 9. Now, to really understand that, you need to read a study of the book of Ruth, but when you do that, you can see what I'm driving at there. I'll leave that for now so we can keep moving. Some suggest that Micah was writing about the threat of the armies of Sennacherib of Assyria, which caused King Hezekiah to seek the Lord. A revival did follow, and God delivered Jerusalem by having an angel kill 185,000 Assyrian soldiers one night. When Sennacherib saw the carnage, he was appalled, and he withdrew, and he never again, he and his successors, attacked Jerusalem. They had succeeded against the north and all that, of course. They tried against Jerusalem, but an angel that was from Hezekiah's prayer uh, killed 185,000 one night. You don't mess with angels. And Sennacherib himself got the message. He backed off and never again attacked the southern kingdom. Let's continue verse 13. Arise and thrash, O daughter of Zion, for I will make thine horn iron, and I will make thy hooves brass, and thou shalt beat in peace as many people, and I will consecrate their gain unto the Lord and their substance unto the Lord of the whole earth. Wow. I wonder what that's all about. Is that an echo of Psalm 83? I'll let you do that and study yourself. All this is going to be done for the glory of God, according to Isaiah 60, first nine verses. He will then be known as the Lord of the whole earth, in contrast to just the Lord of Israel or a Jewish thing. No, no, it's a bigger deal than that. Now, this is a place, by the way, where the Hebrew text and our English translation split off. The Hebrew text divides the verses differently. Chapter 5, verse 1 is the last verse of chapter 4 in the Hebrew text. In other words, if we were cutting this off in the English, you know, uh, uh, it, 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 we're missing a verse. So I'm going to look ahead and pick a verse from next time and stick it here so you get the Hebrew flavor of this. There now appears to be a return here to the thought that we had in verse 9 of chapter 4, the forthcoming Babylonian siege. Okay? So this is the last verse of our chapter 4, so to speak, although we find it in chapter 5. Now gather thyself in troops, O daughter of troops. He hath laid siege against us. They shall smite the judge of Israel with a rod upon the cheek. What does that refer to? A number of conjectures. This would seem to be a reference to the shameful treatment of Zedekiah. King, that he was the, the final king that, uh, that gets, they take him in fetters. They slaughter his sons before his eyes. Then they poke out his eyes so he's blinded and they lead him to Babylon blinded. And he was making fun of the prophets because Ezekiel and Jeremiah couldn't agree. One of them said he's going to die in Babylon and the other one says he'll never see Babylon. And he laughed at him. You guys can't even get your story straight. Oh, oh, oh. grim, grim irony. Because indeed, he had his eyes. He never saw Babylon because he's blinded. And yet he did die there. Heavy, heavy stuff. Anyway, some view the judge of Israel as the Messiah. And this verse is viewed by them as a foreshadowing of the humiliation of Christ. You could do it that way. A couple problems. He wasn't really smitten in a siege as such. That's, that's kind of a stretch. He was, however, smitten in the face, as we see in Isaiah 50, verse 6, and, and uh, Matthew 26, and elsewhere. In fact, it was the stripping off of the beard predicted in Isaiah 50, verse 6, that may have contributed to the apparent difficulties in recognizing him after the resurrection. And there's a whole study on that that we indulge in when we talk about the agony of love and all of that. The degradation of the judge of Israel will be contrasted with the greatness of the future ruler of Israel. The Messiah is highlighted in the most famous verse in Micah 5.2, which follows in the next chapter, which many regard as the most significant prophetic verse in the entire Bible. Let me repeat that. That's quite a preposterous statement. Many believe that Micah 5 verse 2 is the most significant prophetic verse in the entire Bible. Why? Well, that's the assignment for next time. We're going to review that in our next session. So in our next session, I have some questions for you to think about and answer. Why was Jesus born in Bethlehem of all places? 
Beth is house, Lechem bread, the house of bread, okay. Why was Jesus born in Bethlehem? Why was Bethlehem known as the city of David? That's kind of strange. I thought he was a royal guy and he lived in the palaces. No, Bethlehem is known as the city of David. We use that term for the southern part of Jerusalem, but Bethlehem has that title too, the city of David. Who owned the fields where the shepherds encountered the angels? Every Christmas we celebrate the shepherds in the field and the angel comes and visits them and so forth. And uh, we sing Noel or whatever. Who owned those fields? And that may, that may be the key to the whole story here. So you want to go to the book of Ruth and refresh your notes on the book of Ruth before our next session. For our next session, chapter 5, we're going to discover has several passages, not just verse 2, several passages that are deemed by many to be among the most significant prophetic passages for all times. It will also reveal to you what I believe is an error that most people make regarding the Antichrist. And Isaiah 5 and and Ezekiel, I should say uh, Micah 5 and Isaiah 10 and some other passages will reveal something that is still a discovery for many. So with that, let you and I stand for a closing word of prayer.